This episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast is brought to you by On Point Pomade. Keep your beard and hair looking on point with their line of pomades and beard oils over at onpointpomade.com. Use our code BSP15 at checkout and get 15% off your total purchase order. So thanks again to On Point Pomade for sponsoring our show. This episode is also sponsored by the Bean Bastard Coffee. Head over to thebeanbastard.com and pick up any one of their delicious hand-roasted coffees. Coffee lovers will also enjoy their hand-cut and handmade espresso candles and soaps as well. If you're in the Buffalo, New York area, head to their store located at 448 Elmwood Avenue. And thanks again to the Bean Bastard for supporting this show. Brutally Speaking Podcast is proudly sponsored by Rockabilia.com. With over 500,000 officially licensed items in their online store, you're guaranteed to find something you need. Use our code BREW and get 10% off your total order. Now on to the show. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast. I am your host, John, and this episode's guest for two ninety nine dollars is Marcos, the guitarist of P.O.D. I didn't say his last name because I'm honestly not entirely sure how to say it, and I fucking hate saying last names incorrectly. I believe it's Curel, but I don't know. Like, I even Googled his last name in interviews just to see how he says it, and he even mentions, hi, this is Marcos from <laughs> P.O.D., so... I'm going to take the easy way out. You heard me already try to say it. I think it's Curiel. Uh, I think that's how I've heard it, or Curiel. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Again, the East Coast and Midwest in me wants to pronounce vowels uh, in completely different ways, um, so it's quite an anomaly. But this episode is really fun, uh, and I love the way that this happened just so organically over the love of music and the appreciation of of a band. You know, I always get kind of jealous, uh, Dewey over at the Pure Pleasure podcast. He'll just be like, you know, he'll have a great guest and it'll be like, oh yeah, you know, I heard you talk to so-and-so and and then I heard that episode and, and then they reached out to me and said, you should talk to so this person or, you know, that's how, you know, he gets a lot of his guests. You know, even when we have a discussion, it's like a lot of times it's like, well, how do you get people? And I'm like, oh, like, um, usually I go through a publicist <laughs> And uh, I don't necessarily get a lot of uh, recommendations from people, um, but this was one where it happened very organically. Uh, like I said, um, our good friend Ross over at Enjoyed the Ride Records, who we had on the podcast uh, a little while ago, um, put out the 10th anniversary, basically, of Harvard's The Inevitable and I record, their first record outside of uh, Animals, if you have heard that record. And... I noticed Marcos commented on the the release, basically, of, hey, we're going to drop the the repressing of this uh, on Friday. And it was weird because I had just at the time talked to Mike from Stained and had made the comment in, in my chat about how basically Stained was one of the bands that kind of the nation in, in rock, I'll say, that got spun a lot to inspire hope uh, in light of the events of 9-11. And was one of those things where I said, other than P.O.D. probably with Youth of the Nation being probably the anthem for a, a nation that is trying to heal uh, after those events, um, that it was funny that, like, you know, a couple of days later, I basically see this this comment from Marcos, and I was like, hey, really weird. I was just actually talking about you, and, you know, so on and so forth. And then I was like, you know, um, we did the thing, you know, talking about Harvard and the record and we started following each other and then, you know, started DMing and just kind of talking about our love of the band and, and vinyl and, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, then I kind of mentioned, I was like, you know, a long time ago I had Dave Buckner from ex Papa Roach on and he, you know, he said that, you know, who you should get on is Marcos. Like he, he would be good for a long form chat like this. And I was like, absolutely. Like if you want to help me 
get in touch with him. Would love to have him on. Um, but coincidentally, like Dewey also typically says uh, with guests that it takes a long time to get. I think it was better. The band is getting ready to put out the 20th anniversary of Satellite, their, their landmark record with, you know, Youth of the Nation Alive, boom, you know, all those big classic hits. And, you know, it kind of allowed us to reflect on the last big, really big global uh, thing to affect us all was, I, I want to say, 9-11 personally. I mean, it affected the way that, you know, the, the whole country shut down, the way that we now, you know, do travel uh, and some of the things like with enhanced licenses and so forth, like just everything has changed as a byproduct of that event. Very much like uh, a lot has changed and will continue to keep changing in light of the uh, the pandemic that we've all been in over the last you know, 15, 16 months. Um, so it was kind of cool to actually get to reflect a little bit uh, on that record. And also touch a little bit into Marcos's uh, influences guitar playing, because I, I think, you know, as a guitar player, admittedly not super great, but, you know, I tend to, as I try to learn other people's songs, kind of get a feel for what these people are, are doing and, and the things that they're playing. And it's one of those where I've always thought Marcos is, has a very understated playing style. He's, he's not too busy and everything just fits. Uh, it, you can get a sense of feeling from him literally the feeling of marcos playing his guitar and and these notes and these chords and stuff just kind of having to come out of him to to be a part of the song um that's always one of the things that's always that's always one of the things that has endeared me uh, about pod's music as i've grown up with it is basically that it, it's kind of timeless in that sense that it, it's played for the song it feels important that all of them needed to get together to release those things whether it be through the instrumentation or sunny with his lyrics or whatever um to reach us as fans um so that was this is really fun. And, you know, Marcos and I, as you'll hear, uh, really enjoy hip hop and music of all kinds. So this is just kind of really a, a fun kind of loose conversation just about uh, the exploration of finding yourself and your voice through music, whether it be through music that you are literally creating or through music that you are an active participant in experiencing and feeling. Um, I noticed that's kind of been the theme lately, you know, with last week's episode with uh, Chris Hornbrook of Poison the Well, uh, even going back to the episode with Lee from Born of Osiris. Lately, the, the the whole thing and the theme has kind of been self exploration through through music and through other <laughs> other things that allow you to kind of open yourself up a little bit, whether it be therapy or uh, in last week's episode some psychedelics and so forth. But um, yeah, this was a really fun chat, and uh, without further ado. This is my conversation with Marcos from POD, and I'll talk to you on the other side of it. Uh, the last couple of months, I don't really fucking have questions lined up or nothing. Just kind of have a conversation and just see where it goes. All right, let's do it. So, um, first of all, I have you been keeping up with uh, you, you follow basketball, right? I feel like I've seen you post some stuff about it on Twitter, maybe. Follow who? Basketball. Uh, a little bit, man. I'm I'm, I'm a Lakers fan. Okay, well, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's been rough, but you know, it's been. It's been fun i mean it was really bad a few years ago well i mean yeah once kobe left and god i mean i, I feel like I, it's funny because i've been watching uh the show the shop on hbo uh it's lebron's like barber shop style tv show where he just has random basically entrepreneurs but athletes and musicians and so forth on and they just kind of talk about uh kind of them coming to success, the things that they've learned as they've grown up in, in these various industries, the similarities and so forth. And it's really interesting. It, it kind of reminds me of why I love podcasting so much because it's just typically people talking and sharing their stories. And it's one of those where it's a very unfiltered version of these people that we see because of their public personas. Like to hear LeBron be so how I feel like he really is, like in his day-to-day experiences with those that are close to him 
is really interesting and has kind of given me a different perspective on him that then what we see, what he's kind of carefully curated for us on his socials and so forth. But I think it's made me look at him more as a person. Mm-hmm. And in kind of thinking about that, I think that's what I love about podcasts and, and even doing them because, you know, someone like yourself, you know, as I told you in the Instagram comment on uh, that Harvard repress mm-hmm. um, was that, you know, I was I had just talked to Mike from Stained uh, and they were getting ready to celebrate 20 years of Break the Cycle. And remembering when that record came out when I was in high school and, you know, the events obviously of 9-11 happening and how songs like It's Been a While and Pressure and some of the other songs on that record kind of really spoke to a generation that I don't feel like they felt like they had had a voice maybe since Nirvana uh, mm-hmm. or some of the grunge stuff. And in kind of thinking about that, I, I had thought about you and POD collectively because, uh, you know, obviously you guys put out satellite on 9-11 mm-hmm. and, you know, as I was kind of telling Mike, you know, like what's it like kind of looking back realizing you were the soundtrack f- for a, a grieving nation basically. Um you know, because I had said other like other than you guys, I don't really know that anyone else probably has an experience to kind of look back on. Um, so I didn't necessarily mean to get so deep right away, no, but that's, I, dude, that's awesome. Um, you know, I, I mean, you can't plan that. I mean, it was no. a, it was a catastrophe, tragedy, everything that you could think negatively for the country and and everybody, uh, just just worldwide. It was just it was unreal. Hmm. It was surreal. It was just is mind blowing because story I got a story for you like a day or two before we did something with Carson Daly at Battery Park okay and it was right I mean literally like a block or whatever away from the towers and we we had a friend named Maddie Matt from New York and he was like hey man you ever seen the towers let's take a little walk right up you know to the park and you ever you ever seen them up close and I was like nah you know, cause I wasn't, I wasn't in the mood. Mm. And uh, so I, I ended up going and I remember looking up going, wow. You know, it was just like glorious. It was huge, man. And I, and I just was, oh, cool, man. I, I saw it. Let's go back to the stage. Let's go back to the where we're going to jam. And we were promoting Satellite. That's why we were there. And, you know, TRL, Carson Daly, they, they were big, big supporters of our band. And we did a lot of stuff promotion wise moving up up to that to 911 and uh we couldn't never imagined what was going to come like a day or, or two later if i remember correctly but mm-hmm. i remember waking up cuz we had to fly we we did a couple things for promo to fly back home and do a it was a a retail store called the warehouse and we did a signing at midnight and we were tired. We had been traveling around, went home, went to bed. Then I started getting blown up really early in the morning. Like people were texting me, calling me, like, man, what is going on? Hmm. Uh, and come to find out, turn the TV on, turn the TV on. And the first tower had already been, had already been hit and there was smoke coming out of it. And then the second one got hit. And I was like, what the heck? Dude, it was so surreal. And for us, it's a happy moment because our record was dropping that day. We couldn't imagine. We, we, you know, I guess mentally and emotionally, we were like, well, this, this, there goes our, you know, I'm not trying to be selfish, but there goes all the hard work that we put in to this record. And wow, what's, what's going to happen to our country now? Hmm. Well, next thing I know, MTV just gravitated because Alive had been out already. Right. And it was already, I mean, the record was already um, almost three weeks, three weeks out, man. Like it, it went platinum within the first month mm-hmm. or three weeks. And that it's because Alive was out on radio and was already getting pushed hard. So the nation just, they clinged on to that song. MTV clinged onto that song Alive. And it just got played in rotation over and over on MTV and on radio, from what I understand. And a lot of songs like Johnny Pools, Let the Bodies Hit the Floor, like all these songs were getting cut out because it was mm-hmm. such, you know, negativity. I mean, you know, I love that song, but at that moment, it wasn't the right song to play. And obviously, they weren't going to play Boom. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Alive was the, was the anthem 
during that tragedy, man. And mm. a lot of people were messaging us and saying that that song helped them get through that time. And, and, and it's still relevant today, man. And, and, and to answer your question, <clears throat> like what you were asking, Mike, I mean, a song like that, you just never thought it was going to be something that was going to inspire people and have them cling on to, to get them through hard, a hard time like that. And, and then you look at songs like Youth of the Nation, that song's more relevant today than it was then. Mm -hmm. And we wrote that about a specific uh, incident here in San Diego when these school shootings weren't as prominent, man. Right. Um, we, we wrote it because we, we actually did a, <clears throat> an, a charity event for the, the one that happened, the, I think it was Columbine. Um, yeah. Memory and, serves, yeah. Yeah. And then this one happened in San Diego while we were writing a few blocks mm -hmm. away, we were writing satellite. Mm -hmm. So that song was given birth by our sorrow and our pain because on our way to the studio, we used to, we're not like your normal band that, that you know, that writes music at night and parties. We were like, do we have coffee? It's like going to work. <laughs> we we go, we all have families. We all go to meet at the studio. And as we were get going there, helicopters, people speeding. It was like, what's going on? We get to the studio, it's on the TV. Mm. And some kid went in and blasted a bunch of students. And I was like, that's horrible. Next thing I know, I put on my guitar and that first note for Youth of the Nation and we just started jamming and it was giving birth, man. You know, it's just it's just weird, you know, how that stuff works out. But you know that those songs just they have a really strong meaning for a lot of people, man. And I'm glad to have been blessed to be a part of it, you know, as a as a guitarist, as a bandmate, and as as a creator, you know. Out of curiosity, like <clears throat> I I love the solo in Youth of the Nation. I, I think it's one of those like where you know, growing up in the 80s and such with shredders and stuff like that, like <laughs> we grew up in a time and, and probably you more so than me, even it's like, I, I know you're older than I am. So I don't want to necessarily say like maybe even you were inspired by some of the players from the 70s and so forth. But it's one of those like where, you know, sometimes as a not very good musician, when I hear solo, sometimes I'm like, man, I don't even know how like that just feels like someone's like okay, I'm going to play this pentatonic scale. I'm going to keep it in this box. And I know if I just kind of riff in there, it'll be good. Uh, it'll be in the tempo and all this kind of stuff. But sometimes those things don't have the feel. And to me, the thing that's really interesting is while the solo is, is pretty sparse, it's almost what you're not playing. Like you can just literally feel the, the, the essence of kind of like the sorrow and shit coming out of your fingers through your guitar. And I also really loved, and I don't know if it's you playing like behind the nut on the guitar, like the kind of noise behind it, that kind of gives it a nice little, little shimmer to it. But like, yeah. it's just so under, to me, it's just, it's the only way I've ever really been able to articulate it in my head as I listen to it is it almost feels like you had that moment to kind of give a eulogy mm. musically. Yeah. Well, well, dude, I mean, the way I have, okay, well, first off, as a guitar player, I, I'm self-taught. Mm. So I've had a lot of players go, dude, what made you think of these notes and all that? And I'm, I kind of go by that whole James Brown, like, man, if it sounds good and it feels <laughs> good, then it's good, right? So right. I, I'm, I've always been a, a feel-based player. I may not be the most technically savvy, but when I get on stage or when I'm writing a tune, I'm going to put my best foot forward like everyone else does, but it's going to have my, a piece of my heart and soul. And for that song, it doesn't have a gazillion notes, but the players that I admire, like the David Gilmore's, the edge, um, Martin Gore, these guitars that Carlos Santana, it, and, um, Mr. Summers from the police, it's all about space. Mm. And letting the drums and the bass kind of vibe, but then letting the guitar notes come in and out like a land, like like you're the landscaping painter that's just on top of everything, dude. Mm -hmm. And and it is that's my approach. Um, even though I, you know, I mess with, with heavy heavy riffs and stuff like that. That's just my approach when I write. Period. And that solo is really simple, but you're you're not the first person to 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 mention that sort of thing, and it's a big deal to me because. 
you know, they say, oh, dude, a picture's like worth a thousand words or whatever. I feel the same way about a note on guitar. Mm. A guy could be doing sweeps and shredding, but I can go in there like Miles Davis and play one note. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I just killed you. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. With the feel. And, and that's always been my approach, man. And, and thank you so much for noticing that. Respect, bro. Yeah. No, I mean, like I said, like, I think the thing for me is like, you know, I just love music of all kinds. Um, you know, even so it's funny. I, I was asked a question the other day on Twitter. Someone, you know, was like, you know, uh, had reached, I don't remember if it was through the podcast page or whatever, but to me, regardless. And they were like, what are you listening to right now? Cause like, you know, that's new or whatever. Cause you know, I feel like you and I are have very similar styles and music and so forth. And I go, you know, honestly, I don't really feel like I listen to music anymore because since doing this or even going back to when I would write show reviews and album reviews, I just kind of feel like it becomes homework where I have to kind of be like, all right, where's my in- entry route to find a- an interesting question that maybe is a different perspective than what everyone will kind of see on the surface level. And it, sucks because it kind of has ruined music for me a little bit because of that but i was making the comment i was like i feel like for me i like to go back so like lately in the last like three to four years i've really gotten into jay dilla and you know being from michigan i and and loving hip-hop for a long time i should i've always known about him I, i just didn't do my due diligence and you know went back to see like where it all came from mm-hmm. i've now since gone really immerse myself in his music because he's a producer so while he did do stuff that has vocals on it there's a lot of stuff and you know you can find these awesome compilations basically on youtube where they're like four hours long and it's just a beat going into another beat going into another beat for four hours Mm. um and i've since kind of gone okay like i think i've got my dylan knowledge now let's go see like the stuff he did with slum village let's go see the stuff he did with common let's go see you know these things and kind of see where some of these other like the background or the backpack rap the indie rap kind of game from the the 95 to like 99 mm-hmm. let's kind of see where like that where that went what did that start inspiring and even kind of coming up with like, okay, like Slum Village ended up losing Dilla, then they end up getting this other guy, then Kanye started working with him. And then I'm like, okay, I'm a huge Kanye fan. Okay, now I'm really starting to see the Dilla influence in Kanye's early stuff and how he kind of took that production style, that lo-fi sample, sample heavy kind of production style and ran with it, you know, and took it forward, you know, basically on Jay-Z's Blueprint record, which subsequently came out around the same time, uh, actually I think on 9-11 as well. Uh, or right around there, because I remember really wanting to get that record. Um, but it was just kind of one of those things where I made the comment, like, that first that I was like, I felt like I was a bit rude and pretentious, like, oh, I don't really listen to music anymore. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, actually, I do still listen to music, but I look at it now from a different perspective where I'm like, okay, what can I learn about where the music went? Where did it come from? And how has it informed music going forward? And then now I'm starting to notice when I do things like that and I go on these deep dives and learn as much as I can about these different eras of music, whether it be hip hop, rap, you know, hardcore, whatever, that then I'm able to have conversations like with you where I'm like, I'm able to talk to you in a different way because I'm able to pull from maybe some of your same influences that Mm -hmm. you don't get to talk about very often. Like, I think when Satellite came out, I remember you guys did a song with Ika Mouse and everyone's like, well, how did that come to play? And you guys were like, (laughs) oh my God, we're really big into reggae and we do all this kind of stuff. And it was just really cool to get this legend in this scene on our stuff and kind of co-sign a side of us that we've not really been able to, to showcase but like it feels kind of like that that blessing being put down on like the ladder kind of being extended and so forth and uh it's one of those like when i listen back to that record i remember that interview and remembered you guys saying that thing and it's like i feel like that's what makes your band really interesting is like you said you're pulling from all kinds of different stuff that maybe n- wouldn't be someone who listens to use obvious influences like oh of course i could totally hear how you guys are influenced by the police or you are influenced by the police or this person or this person um but i think when you go back and do your due diligence and listen to older music to see where things came from it becomes so much more obvious like the little sprinklings that musicians put in throughout their careers yeah man <clears throat> it, it's a trip man because i think a lot of people you know they don't like to do research especially now <laughs> I, come from, I come from a day and age where we used to go to the the record store and look through vinyls or CDs and actually put headphones on to listen mm-hmm. to a band because we saw the artwork and we're like, this is pretty cool. What is this? Yeah. And you'd pop it in and you'd listen. <clears throat> right now, everybody wants that quick instant fix, which 
whatever, man, it's a different time, but that's not our band. Our mm -hmm. band, I don't know how, how, how much you know since Satellite from now, we, we started doing that then and mm -hmm. we never stopped. And that came from our hip hop influences yeah. from, you know, from, uh, from Dre, you know, from that West coast, sound where they were doing all these collaborations but that was unheard of in rock music right and and when our label was atlantic was like who do you want to put on your record we're like dude we want to get uh hr from bad brains we want to get eco mouse and why those guys are like relics and all the not to us <laughs> and we were like no way they're legends man and you know what our fan base needs to know Mm. That that's the sort of thing that that influenced us and still does to this day. We're fans of music, and right. if you if you do your research within our band, we've got Mike Muir, Paige mm -hmm. Hamilton, mm -hmm. you know, recently on the Awakening album, Lou from Sick of It All, um, and what's very, um, what's um, what's amazing to me, and I'm honored when they come to when they re when they reply when we hit them up to be on something. And they have this mad respect, like, dude, let's do it. Yeah. And we're like, dang, okay. And when you see your peers or your influences coming back with respect, that's when you're like, dude, they, they know what's up. <laughs> and, 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 it, and it's cool, man. Um, so, you know, it's just one of the, the, one of the perks that we, we, we've been able to pull off, you know, Modest Yahoo. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just a mix, man. And um, a lot of people just like to write us off. Oh, that's that that's that Christian band or, or, or that's that new metal band or, or that's a, this. And I'm like, dude, you don't even know. You, you have written through more. As I say, you guys have written through more <clears throat> genre tags that like, that are just flavors of that particular time. And instead it's like, yeah, we are all those things. And we're also even more, mm -hmm. but we've, all, <laughs> we've also had the, like, you guys have been around long enough that I, I don't understand why when people talk about what the band has done, why, and I'm not saying that people don't, but I feel like there is a little bit of that discrediting where it's like, Oh, you're just a new metal band. It's like, yeah. And we went through that phase. And when that wasn't the cool tag anymore, we got slapped with a different one, but we're still here. Yeah. Like, out of those, respect out of that. that. Era, out of that era. We're one of the few still standing with the same original members, dude. Yeah. And, and it's crazy because we always joke around. Because when we were getting played on the radio back then, we were getting played on the alternative format. Mm. Now we're getting played on active rock, which, okay, I'll take it. But active rock, when you listen to the bands on there, we definitely got our own niche and sound in there because it's, it's, it's just not what we do. <laughs> and 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 there's no there's no disrespect to what was going on on there. It's just we joke around because I mean shit, we're still here, mm. like. We've seen trends come and go, even back when we started, man. It went from, you know, uh, ska, pop punk, ska, and then it went from that to <clears throat> uh, rap, new metal, rap rock. And then it was all these different things, and we were just kind of coasting through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, yeah, well, you're that Christian man. Well, yeah, we have faith, bro. Whether we were <laughs> Rastafarians or we were Christian or whatever, that doesn't mean that we never tried to label ourselves that. Does, does, you know, is, 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 you know, there's just so many things that people just want to put tags on and it's frustrating. There's all these stigmas and I'm like, you know what, <clears throat> we're just a rock band, dude. And we we're very passionate about what we do and, and what we believe in, but that's not everything. That's not mm -hmm. all of us. That's not the whole pie. Those are different shades and colors. If you get to know our band and take, take our music out on a date and get to know <laughs> us, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you're gonna find that there's a lot of flavor, and I think sometimes in rock and roll, people don't want that much flavor. They want a plain ass hamburger with ketchup, and you're like, "Yo, well, when you get ours, you're gonna have salt, pepper, little salsa, avocado on there, onions, and you're gonna get some flavor." Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as you were kind of saying, a few things kind of came to mind as you were just, you know, kind of talking about. Um, you know, just the tags and so forth. And, and one of the things that I, I kind of have wondered as you were saying that is, do you feel that's kind of maybe the beginning of this? I don't know. Separation is what I want to say, but just kind of this, this making everything be a microcosm of a microcosm of a microcosm. Do you think that kind of really started 
back then with with trying to separate music into these buzzwords or whatever to sell it or do you think it kind of goes back even further than that i think the music industry and record labels do that because they want it to be relatable to the listener and mm. a lot of listeners i hate to say it dude are like this <laughs> and and like yourself or, or and me like i i I'm pretty open-minded. I know what, I love that music is subjective. Mm. I don't like everything, but I won't knock it. I'll be like, that's not for me. Yep. I, won't, I won't listen to that, but it's an art form and I respect it. So, mm. you know, a lot of people, I mean, when my younger days, I was all metal. I mean, you know, Metallica, Faith No More, Iron Maiden, you know, and I was like, this is it. But that's <laughs> was how I evolved as a player, you know? And of course, my family turned me on to, you know, the early on with vinyl, Hendrix, Zeppelin, the classics, dude, the doors. And I, I grew up on all that and I just kind of made my own sound. And, and that's the one thing I'm grateful, you know, I got my own sound. I ain't the, I ain't, you know, Petrucci or whatever. I ain't like a shredder, <laughs> but I got, I got my own sound and everybody has noticed that. And I'm grateful for that because that's, that's priceless as a guitarist because a lot of guitar players can sound exactly the same because they're all doing the same pentatonic scales and the, mm -hmm. and it's like, dude, you sound like a, like this cookie cutter. You're shredding. That's hard to do. But I did that early on when I was a youngster, dude, I was learning all my sweeps and, and then I realized it's not about this. It's about feel, man. And our band is all about feel and it's about being raw and, and, and dude, I mean, that's, some people they're used to hearing tracks behind their bands, which we don't have nothing against. You know, we'll mess with it at some point. Maybe I don't know. I'm not counting it out, but it's all raw. Do you plug in? You're gonna hear feedback. You're gonna hear me tuning. I purposely do not, not always, but I don't mute my my pedal when I tune, like the old school Hendrix, like at live and I do all that on purpose because I want people to know. This shit's live, dude. Mm. This is mm. four individuals trying to connect and vibe together. And mm -hmm. that's what's bringing you this raw sound. And it's not perfect. Someone told me once rock and roll's perfect, it's not rock and roll anymore. And then once Disney got involved, this we can go down <laughs> that whole thing. I Carly, all that whole, that whole, you know, high school, whatever, the high school musical, mm -hmm. that whole time just changed everything, dude. And then it got into rock. That's my opinion. And everyone just started being super perfect live. And they were playing the Millie Vanilli had something, man. Like they were onto something, bro. Like straight up. You know, but we keep it raw, dude. And 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 um we try and but we're, we're, we're not closing our minds up. Like, well, we'll mess with some samples and stuff. But dude, that's what you get with POD. Well, I think <clears throat> and the Millie Vanilli thing I, I think is kind of interesting because and I know a lot of people have talked about them essentially being scapegoats initially, but I guess essentially now as time has gone on being almost pioneers of what would become just regular performances. Like, you know, the fact that it's like, Oh, well you found out that they didn't write their music. So it's like, Oh, well, not only did they not write it, but now they're not even singing it and they're performing to tracks like, and everyone gave them a lot of shit to the point where, and I don't remember which one it was, but like that one of them, like through the shame and guilt, I guess, of just constantly being, referred to as kind of a joke or whatever it's like you know ended up killing himself and it's like now you have people who that's how they make their career and it's almost like one of those like where people are just like yeah i don't care like i was at a janet jackson show uh many years ago and i was doing a show review uh for it and i remember you know i'm a big janet jackson fan i'm a big you know terry jam and uh i'm sorry i think i'm getting my names mixed up um jimmy jam and terry lewis um you know, the guys that wrote a lot of that stuff of that era, like, you know, Black Cat and all that kind of stuff. And it was really a bummer for me to see the band just obscured uh, in darkness, literally, and being kind of an afterthought and realizing like Janet's lip syncing pretty obviously. And, you know, I kind of started writing some notes, you know, just to kind of formulate like in my like in the moment, this is what I'm thinking. So when I go to write the review, I can pull from from them. My wife just kind of put her hand over my phone and was just like, no one cares about that. They don't. And then she was just look around. And I looked around and, you know, like, obviously, like, it's mainly a lot of older black people. And what was really funny is, like, there was a couple 
like three rows down from me and they're fucking showing out all dressed up they're dancing they're having a good fucking time and i was just like that's what i need to focus on that's what i should write my review about is what is it doing to everybody how is it making how is the timeless music that we all grew up with or love you know for one reason or another how does it make us feel when we're all in a room together listening to it and seeing Mm -hmm. this person perform it literally performing it and at that point i was like the musician in me and the person who wants to have the band be highlighted and that's why i think i love band like you know artists like justin timberlake who integrates his band into the live show and things like that um but it was one of those like that was really a a turning point for me as a person kind of who i guess objectively reviews music or whatever that i was like i guess it's not about that i guess it's it's not about the fact that I can tell that this is playing the tracks and stuff like that. And and I feel like I'm being slighted as, as a fan of this, but other people don't care. They expect that it should be perfect. And in that regard, that was where I very much changed my thought on people playing the tracks and so forth. I still think it's disingenuous a little bit. I wish they would just come out and be like, look, we have tracks. But we're trying to give you the show that you paid ninety, hundred, two hundred dollars to come see. You expect perfection, and this is the only yep. way that we can ensure that perfection is going to happen. Well, dude, that's why music is subjective, dude. That's why when you go to a restaurant, you prefer this restaurant over that restaurant when it comes to food, right? Right. I, and you know what? That's okay. I'm not a hater on it. I, I appreciate it too, man. Like I went to go see Post Malone with my son, mm. and um. He's like, I need help with the lyrics. I drank too much last night. And then, <laughs> and then, dude, just to hear him take breaks and breathers and the mic's down and the track's still rolling, he didn't care. He didn't care. The yeah. crowd didn't care either. No. And they were partying. like It was like a DJ just spinning the song. And I was like, wow. I go, dude, that's that's awesome. Like I, I thought it was hilarious because I'm all, that is awesome. He's got it made. Like you yeah. can go up and just do that. <laughs> not, not discrediting his skill set, mm-hmm. but I was like, that's just where we're at. at. That's just where we're at. Like, you know, like for instance, Prince, you're going to compare Prince with Janet Jackson. Hmm. There is none because you know why? She's an entertainer. She can sing. She's like a J-Lo. I mean, there's no compare. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. It, it's entertainment. Up, and, and they're entertaining. Prince is a musician and an entertainer yeah he'll entertain but he can also jam and be like yo what's up i can throw <laughs> down you know what i'm saying yeah so there's just there's different you know different strokes for different folks man and i i don't hate on it i'm just saying for my band we're constantly evolving we don't count anything out we met you know we'll do collabs we'll mess with samples we'll, we'll even maybe run some background track here and there but we're not it's all feel based is what I was trying to get at. Yeah. But I, it's just, you know, I'm still old school with my amps, dude. I still mm. use tube amps. Everyone's using Kempers, Kempers and all this stuff. And they're like, dude, why are you bringing that heavy stuff? I go, I go cause you know why? I like the feel and the sound. Well, people don't care. I, I, I do. And that's what matters. I'm the one that has to play it. Yeah. And that, that noise and that hiss and all that shit. No one else is getting that anymore, and I'm okay with it. <laughs> yeah, you I went. Know what I'm saying? I went through the same thing recently. I got a uh, Fishman's put into one of my guitars because I was like, you know, a lot of my friends really love them, and I was like, all right, like I know I love my EMGs. Like that's what I like. Give me some EMGs, eighty one, sixty five or eighty five to eighty one. Like pfft. for a metal tone, like perfect. If it works for Metallica, it'll work for me. Yeah. and finally like a buddy of mine was like what are you running i was like oh, i got this like kind of shitty head whatever it's like a digital uh head basically a pre-kemper more or less yeah. uh, i actually think it was uh one of the line six uh spiders i think you actually had done some stuff and built some tones in yourself way back yeah. in the day and was one of those things where i was like man this has got so many different tones i love it it's really easy to use and he was like yeah but you're not gonna notice you're not really gonna really be able to showcase what those pickups can do if you don't have like a real like tube head so then i started the whole process of like what do i want my sound to be like how and all this kind of stuff and then i dropped the money on a pb 51 5153 and then i had to start buying pedals and all this kind of other stuff and i'm like fuck i forgot like this is why i never wanted to go down this route because it yeah. just gets so expensive to kind of figure out like what 
in theory, you want to kind of build your tone around and, and all these kind of things. But it is one of those that there is something for as much as everyone's like, you should have bought a camper, you should have bought a camper, you should have bought a camper. I just kind of keep going, telling myself, it's like, yeah, but there's something kind of cool about turning that thing on. And then once the tubes kind of warm up and get really nice and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the sounds good, like that, like probably 20, 30 minutes into playing, like everything just kind of starts feeling and sounding good. It's like, yeah, but you can't get that. Like with a, you know, you kind of like, like you were it's saying, like, like you got to earn it kind of, you got to earn the everything when you're playing like with real things, like something could go wrong and you got to like figure out like what's going on. How do I fix this? Like, and maybe sometimes there's those weird imperfections that become something that you're like, that was really cool. Mm -hmm. Like Tom Morello is the king of like that guitar is broken. No, it's not. That's the thing that makes that guitar really cool is the mess up, the mistakes that it makes, the buzzing, the whatever. And to me, it seems like you are someone that very much is let me kind of find my way through things. I love the imperfections are what makes things more fun and challenging to me as a player because it's real. It's authentic. Yep. And I'm on the same page with you, man. And that's, you know, you want to go back to hip hop, like the record for me growing up in the early nineties, when I graduated mm -hmm. tribe called quest, Midnight mm. Marauders. that yeah. album, I can't get enough of, mm. I'll pop that in. And it's just like, Oh, it just takes you there. It's like, heck yeah dude like them to me and their story oh my gosh it's such a it's so heart-wrenching the way they got ripped <laughs> off yeah know, being that, as iconic you know and i met fife dog dude in la mm. got his number i mean rest in peace he passed away but dude i freaking i can appreciate when hip-hop was immersed with jazz dude mm. you know diggable planets you know um you know, uh, from dubious, you know what I mean? It, it just had a certain sound like soul. The, yeah. You know, uh, souls of mischief mm -hmm. all that stuff, dude. Like that is my era. The jazzmatazz freaking the guru, like, and see a lot of my peers in metal and punk, they don't know much of that. And that's okay. That's my journey. Yeah. But, but I think that when, as a band, we, we always set out to be different, not to be contrived, but just like, hey, we're from the neighborhood. Our homies like hip hop, they like punk, all this stuff, reggae. Why can't we mix that into our music? And that's why everybody loves Sublime too, man. You know, cause everybody's like, dude, that's all about a vibe. You could pop Sublime in and be like, dude, where's the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's funny you bring up a tribe called Quest because in my going back actually to my Dilla like due diligence kind of um, Slum Village, I was texting with a buddy of mine and I was like, dude, like I've been getting back into Slum Village and just kind of the different iterations of that. And it reminds me of times of a tribe called Quest. And he goes, yeah, they were like the poor man's tribe, uh, even though they came out roughly at the same time and, you know, had a lot of similarities. But it was a thing where I had actually just learned uh, the other day. Um, Speaking of Tribe and specifically Q-Tip and Janet Jackson to kind of really bring this all together in the hip hop things of what we've been talking about is I guess Janet had reached out to Q-Tip and was like, yo, do you have a beat for me? Like, do you have something like I want to put something on this new record, something a little different? He goes, yeah, I got this beat. And he uses the Joni Mitchell sample for uh, Got Till It's Gone. That was a Dilla beat that he gave her. So and then obviously it became a huge fucking single off of Velvet Rope and is one of those things that kind of relaunched Janet in a different sense of what we had known her from, from like Rhythm Nation and all that as more of like an adult kind of crossover artist. And uh, was one of those that I was like, man, so many people don't know that A, that's a Dilla beat, probably don't even know that Q-Tip gave her that beat like or know that it came from someone from a Tribe Called Quest or any of that yeah. kind of stuff. And it's just one of those that it's like, it's so crazy to think sometimes about how things that are, the underground always inf is informing mainstream. We just don't know it because people aren't willing to to learn or, or care, I guess, really is what it boils down to. And I think that's the thing that just is really sad to well, me. Just like in anything, though, you, you got to have uh, the desire to learn. A lot of people are so close-minded. When you get into politics, when you get into food, when you get into things that like, that really truly matter music a lot of people don't want they don't want to get like um they don't want their eyes to be open or they're just like they're just on a they're on a different path at that moment i only listen to death metal or you know 
emo or whatever. And I'm like, well, that's too bad. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> because you should, un but see, it's, I don't think the IQ and intellect with some of these music listeners, they just, they don't get it. That's why. And, um, you know, one, one thing I was telling a friend, you know, they asked me, what do you think it takes for an artist to make it these days? Mm. Obviously, you got marketing, you got to have something different. But I, I, I think I figured it out. I decoded it. Mm. You got to have a voice. And what mm. I mean by that, I'm not talking like a voice in the sense of like, oh, you know, I'm standing up for this or that. I'm talking about a voice, a tone. Mm. Let's do the comparisons here. I, the 90s, just in the 90s. You got Cypress Hill, right? You got Rage Against the Machine, Eddie Vedder, Pearl Jam, the Chili Peppers, Smashing Pumpkins. Everybody's voice and tonality is completely different. If you think about that, mm -hmm. system of a down, you mm -hmm. think about whether you like Sonny or or uh, or Sonny's voice in my band or let's say um, Anthony Kiedis and the Chili Peppers, mm -hmm. you know it's them you know it's their voice. And the right. problem is, is that you have bands coming out that all sound similar and they're like, why not? I don't understand why we never made it. Well, yeah, because you sound like 10 other bands that are trying to sound like Maynard. Or you sound like, you know, a gazillion other bands that try to sound like this guy. It's like, you gotta have your own tonality. Uh, uh, Axl Rose, you when you heard that, hey, Archie, you know, like you heard his voice, come on, you know what I mean? That yeah. you knew it was him. That's what I feel is the key to success with the right band backing, especially in rock. You have to have your own voice and, and it has to have its own tone. And people got to know like, oh, yeah, I know who that is. At first, they think it's weird, right? When people first heard System of a Down, they were like, what is this? That's weird, <laughs> right? But now it's yeah. the norm. And you're like, dude, that's awesome. I love it. You know, well, something and kind of, again, parlaying or I should say mirroring hip hop. You know, I, I've had the pleasure of talking to a lot of hardcore bands from the East Coast, where I'm from originally, and from the West Coast. But I live here in the Midwest, and it's weird because, like, I remember, you know, my love of just different music came from, A, being a product of an MTV generation, literally, where it's like, this hour I might see hip-hop, this next hour I'll see alternative music, the next hour I'm going to get whatever. But then being like, Delaware is not a big city, like, and I'm not even going to claim that it is this mecca of music. But we're not too far where people are going to Connecticut, they're going to Pennsylvania, they're going to New York, they have friends, family in these areas that are then going like, hey, here's Biggie, here's, you know, Boys to Men, here's like all these things before they kind of really hit. And thinking about it in terms of like hardcore, like the East Coast hardcore scene was way different than the West Coast stuff that was coming out of like Orange County and so forth in the early late 90s, early 2000s. And it was one of those like where I've talked to some people where I go, you know, like talking to James from 18 Visions or whatever. And I'm like, you know, when you guys came from the, the West Coast and you're going east, what was the vibe like? And he goes, oh, you know, we were getting called fag all the time because we were fashion heavy. Like I worked at Abercrombie, so I got a discount on clothes. Most of our band did. So we looked different than everybody. But it's funny because the second and third time we started coming around, now everyone's starting to look like us. But, you know, we're influenced by stuff that we were hearing from the East Coast, like stuff like Dead Guy, stuff like, you know, these other bands. So it was interesting at a time where we didn't have the Internet to just like literally someone go, hey, have you heard of this band? No, give me a second. Oh, OK, yeah, that's pretty cool. Like you kind of had to actively seek to be a fan or be a part of your, your scene or whatever. And I think something that's always interested me in talking to more people from your era of, you know, rock, basically like, you know, Dave from Papa Roach and so forth is – you know, you've talked about all your big different different influences, and I can't understate probably how just living in California and just the diversity of the people regionally is for you to have all your different influences. I mean, you look at a band like Papa Roach, who were bringing on, you know, Infest with that hidden track. You know, they're bringing the reggae vibe that a lot of people probably wouldn't have assumed they would do. They do stuff where it's a little bit more kind of punk leaning straight ahead rock metal just like you guys were doing just like alien ant farm kind of has songs where they're able to bring in like flamenco -y kind of stuff or tradition like non-traditional -tra -tra like rock stuff and i can't help but think like man i'm i feel so 
jealous that you had this wealth of diversity to be able to pull from and then literally get to go see other bands doing the same thing you're doing in the sense of like fuck it there are no rules we're just gonna write good time stuff and have a have fun playing and i feel like that's something that i don't know if we'll get to kind of experience anymore not like that i I agree um because it's sad man when you when you look at the scene like talk about hardcore or punk everybody sounds exactly the same i mean not not exactly but there's a lot of similarities in the tones and production and in the way that songs are structured and you're like who's this yeah. sounds like this band but you got to remember it was like that in the 80s <laughs> not not for the progressive metal bands like the maidens and the queen's reichs and, and the fates warning i'm talking or even the De- like the new wave depeche mode and mm-hmm. new order it was more on the hair band side, which I like to compare what's going on in rock mm-hmm. right now to that. Everyone mm-hmm. has the same look. Everyone's got the same scene. Everyone's vibing the same. Cool, whatever, dude. But it took one Nirvana to come in and shut everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that? You yeah. Know, it, it, it killed everyone's career. So, yeah. And then the 90s after that, that's where all the bands I'm telling you about they all had their own identity. I don't know if we'll see that again because what's being fed to the generation now, like my kids, is like trap beat, uh, the the modded vocal sing along rap, which 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 is cool. I like some of that. I so you you said you came up with the formula basically for how to be a successful band. I think I stumbled across where this mumble rap trap music came from. I think it started back with 3-6 Mafia because they were the originators of the just a hook ad nauseum over a trap beat. Juicy J is to blame <laughs> for the new mumble rap scene. <laughs> yeah, cash money, cash money record. Them too, yeah. Um, yeah. But then when you think about it, like who took it to the on the big level? Wheezy, bro. You know that. Well, yeah. Once he, well, then you know what he tied in with Drake, mm-hmm. and then it just kind of just, you know. But I think that I mean even that for as much as people want to hate on Drake or Little Wayne and stuff like that, I think I, Wayne. I, I, I'm a huge fan of both of them, by the Tim. way, because yeah. they're they're badass to me. And then when people talk to us, I'm like, dude, how can you hate yeah. on the brilliance? I mean, Drake came on, just showed you that he can flow. Yep. And that's when I was like. Oh man, the furthest thing is my jam, dude. <laughs> the way he turns, I love how yeah. he'll turn a phrase. Basically, he'll give you a line and then basically flip it back the other way, and you're just like, "Huh, that's yeah. that's good. I like that." Yeah, um, brilliant. But it's it, the thing that I always say for as much as people want to shit on Wayne, and I was actually I had a, a different guest on, and we talked about when Wayne did a medley of the old Hot Boy stuff. Like back when Wayne was like 14, 15, was like only being guested on some of the stuff, barely had any verses on anyone's stuff. And I go, but the thing that you can't deny about, I'll say like that Wheezy, I think has taught Drake, Nikki, and all of the others that were on Young Money is I feel like he just is like work, 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 work. And if you have a tireless work ethic, ain't no one going to outperform you. And at the very least, if something don't hit here, it'll hit somewhere else because you've put in the work. And for as much as people want to slam Drake or whatever and be like, oh, he's, he's just everywhere. And it's like, yeah, because the dude's like just tirelessly working. He well, out, he will outwork anybody. <laughs> he's riding the wave because, yeah. you know, in life, nothing lasts forever, dude. No. So he'll ride that wave until he can't ride it already. He'll be like, dude, Done. I cast out big time, yep. bro. Yeah. Which is awesome. More, and more power to him, dude. He's a great entertainer, though, man. I saw the tour when him and, and Wheezy went out together. I and, was supposed to go see that. I did not. And uh, it was so creative. They had an app where you could actually vote mm-hmm. on each guy. And it, they had a Street Fighter, I want to mm-hmm. say. Yep. It was freaking awesome, dude. Yeah. And, and I was like, I'm, I'm entertained right now. I, I took my nephew to his first concert. He was he was just over the moon, like, just freaking loving it. And I was like, just seeing the spot. Once again, <laughs> though, that's entertainment, though, like what you're saying about John Jackson. Yeah. Whether it's reggae, whether it's punk, whatever style of music, if it's bringing good vibes to the people, you got to remember, we're we're in the entertainment business regardless. No matter how you look at it, you're the getaway for the people that are going nine to five, 
They want to go to a show and think, not think about their problems. Go, dude, I'm going to go to this show and have a good time, man. And when and you know, when you see shows like that, like these these kind of I'll call them big spectacle shows, like. You know, one of the best shows I've ever seen, and people are always kind of giving me crap for it, is that Kanye Life of Pablo tour where it was the floating stage and the lights. Yeah. One of the most incredible shows I've ever seen. I've never seen an arena full of people not leave for one song. Like, as soon as the show started, it was like, that's it. I'm in until the show's done. Never seen a crowd that engaged, ever. Um, so, for as much as you and people sometimes want to talk on, on a – Kanye for not being good. It's like I, I've seen some really big acts, and I and I there's always the bathroom song, and I and I never saw that that entire show. But uh, <laughs> well, when you when you see shows like that, though, what do you as a performer take away that you then try to bring to what you do in POD? Well, I mean, it makes you get it gives you some perspective. You're like, okay, these guys invested a lot of their money. Mm -hmm. into their production and a lot of times you just want to get on stage throw a banner up and just rock right mm -hmm. where it's more competitive these days with rock especially in active rock people are doing you know the productions are getting bigger and, and what what and it's kind of set this bar pretty high with people are expecting that mm -hmm. and um unless you're an indie rock band where people don't expect that stuff it starts to turn you want to get into that arena forum or that bigger theater you got to start bringing that production no matter who you are it's just the way it is unless you're a band like rage that can get away with it like i mean dude radiohead has some of the dopest light performance you know what i mean and that's one of my favorite bands you know tool mm. <laughs> you know so it's just inspiring you take ideas and go, that was pretty cool how they did that, how they incorporated the crowd with the, with the app, like for when I went to the Drake show. I was like, that's cool. That shit's expensive because the app costs <laughs> You know what I mean? So yeah. it, it, I think we grab, we all grab as musicians inspiration from different, from different places. And, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but for me as a guitar player, you know, per discussion with different friends of mine that play in the industry that are professional guitar players, they're like, what makes you come up with, with these certain parts? How do you do that? Like, I don't, I don't hear it in a lot of other guys playing. I go, there's certain players that I admire and I'll grab from, but this is my secret, dude. I listen to EDM. Mm. I listen to a lot of like deep house, ambient trance. And, and I'm like, damn, that's a sick vibe right there. Now, is there any way <laughs> I can try to incorporate that somehow in my playing? Or taking that, grabbing from that and trying to incorporate that in what, what I do. That's why you hear the space. That's why you hear the delays. That's why you hear the openness. Because that's a big part of that and alternative music. So it's like, I'm a big alt fan, but I love metal. But it's always been incorporated into my sound. So that just gives you a piece. Like I love I love electronic music because of people and people will bag on me. Oh, that shit's whack, man. And <laughs> this and I go, you know how hard it is because I I mess with programs. That that all those tracks in there you're hearing that's that's not just one track, dude. Right. Layers upon layers of sitting and just building this opus, dude. <laughs> you know, and once again, people don't get it, but when you're at the when you're at the EDC and you're vibing out, it's amazing, dude. You know what I'm saying? So I, I love that man. And, um, you know, anyways, just a little insight on, on my plane from, from that angle. I think, you know, I always think it's funny because like the people who I talk to that, like, you know, through doing this a lot of times, uh, you know, end up kind of becoming friends with a lot of the people and just kind of sharing similar experiences or kind of being like, Oh, I noticed it. Like, you know, Andrew from the coast inside, he'd put out a, uh, a solo record basically an ep uh it's all instrumental and it's kind of in that sort of like genty style like whatever but it was a, a lot of it i'll say was influenced by the the crash that the band had um and you know like i remember when talking to him i was like you know the song is called icu but it's like as you kind of had things going on it reminded me of my time in a hospital having surgeries and so forth and you know these experiences i had and it took me like right there where i could smell like the hospital smell and all these things and you know he was like oh my god yeah same like as you said that i can close my eyes and i can be transported right there and i think that's 
sometimes I, I feel like that's what we're losing with music is like where you want to say something or you, you're and even the lack of saying something like if it's just instrumental where people, I feel like a lot of times won't give the instrumental a fair shake. Like I, I don't know why iTunes has been doing this. I don't know if it's something new or not, but I've noticed certain bands will have instrumental versions of records out like a trade of the curse on iTunes. They have the instrumental version of that. And it's really interesting to listen to that record, a record I've listened to so many times, but really start being able to pick apart little nuances of things like background overdubs and so forth. And just kind of being like, huh, I've never, never noticed that or Mm -hmm. how that will impact a vocal that I, I didn't notice that that's where that vocal is kind of riding the, the, as you were saying, like with your guitar solo or whatever, like it's not fighting, it's weaving in and out of the beat or whatever. And it's those kind of things that really now I'm getting more into like, not necessarily EDM, but like just kind of like instrumental music because I want to kind of see like, this is what a vocalist is being handed so would I have come up with that chorus or that that melody or anything? Like, how did you find your way through that? Kind of going back to, like, finding your way and learning. Mm-hmm. And it's really interesting. Like, I would be interested to hear a, basically an instrumental album of P.O.D. stuff and really see what I can start picking apart mm-hmm. between like, you, Tra, and, and Wolf and all that. And just kind of being like, all right, what is Sonny hearing when he gets this stuff? And how is he working his way through what he does? And I'm sure I would be very surprised at, a lot of the little like overdubbing and overlaying stuff that you guys are probably putting in there that a lot of us probably don't get to hear. Well, I mean, I have a project that I've been working on for over a year. It's called foreign lands. Okay. And and it's an instrumental project, three piece. And uh, the whole, I guess, mission with that band is instrumental records, but then doing at some point like an, like an encyclopedia set, three or four songs with a guest vocalist over mm-hmm. music that we write. There's no set structure. It's almost like jazz. It's like, you know, jammy or whatever. There is structure, but it, it, it's just, it, it's not going to get played on the radio per se. But yeah. I want to do a, okay, volume one through four is, let's just say, I'm going to throw just figuratively that this isn't happening, but like, let's say my, my boy from uh, Sweden, from Blindside. Mm. We got Foreign Lands with Christian, blah, 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 volume one through four, volume five through s- whatever, s- eight or nine, I get Sonny. Mm. Foreign Lands with Sonny Sandoval. And then I want to keep building this little thing. There's not one set singer. Maybe we'll put a record, mm. we have one, but and then in between all that, you have instrumental records. So Foreign Lands, if you get a chance and go to my Instagram, it's the link is up top. You'll hear little instrumental pieces on that page. But I've been working on that for quite some time. It's very progressive. Um, hmm. it, it's heavy and at times very open and spacey. I wanted to recommend uh, one of my favorite um, electronic artists is, is a guy from Colorado, Lane 8. Amazing, amazing dude. His writing and his skill set, the way that he does electronic music is amazing, dude. I mean, I have a playlist on Spotify. Um, I'll, I mean, I'll send it to you. Um, but those are like my favorite songs of his. But you can sit back and do anything. Drive, put headphones on, and just trip out on everything. The way everything builds, it's melodic. It's freaking sexy. It's just dope. You know, and um, that and Cascade, Cascade, those are the two uh, guys that I, that I, and you know, I've been a fan since way back when. Like, that's why we did, I don't know if you ever heard it, POD's Boom with Crystal Method. Yeah. Yep. And then we did another one with Paul Oakenfold, The Messenger. Um, so we've always did that. And, and a lot of that came from me because I was like, dude, this, you know, I wanted to get the Chemical Brothers, but it never happened. You know? <laughs> I, back then, you know, I was just like, dude, and now these two guys are the guys that I'm like, dude, if I had my, my wish, mm-hmm. we POD would be doing some stuff with lane eight or cascade, you know? Like, are you kind of, cause it seems like a lot of people right now are getting into uh band or this group called gunship. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with them at all. It sounds familiar. I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent though. They're kind of like on this, like, synth wave kind of like and that seems to be the thing a lot of people are getting into right now is this like synth wave uh 
trend kind of i'll call it but like gunship to me almost feels like a little bit of like eight like that like eight bit kind of sounding stuff um like from video games but also with like tinges of like film scores that you would have like almost like a little bit of like john carpentery kind of stuff kind of going on with some of the synths and stuff like that and it's it's i really like it it's it's definitely like I, we had a fire a couple like about a month or so uh and i just put out like our home pod thing out in the backyard and threw that on and it's like you know it's dark we got a fire going and then it's just kind of like real chill kind of vibe and everyone's like what is what is this and i was like oh it's gunship like uh andrew from tgi turned me on to this because he's like oh i'm really big into this like synth wave kind of stuff right now and it's just funny to kind of see it coming back around. Like you were talking about like the, the new wave kind of thing that was coming around with like Depeche Mode and um, Cocteau Twins and like a lot of that kind of stuff. And it's funny to kind of see it sort of coming back around in this, the synth wave stuff. Um, <clears throat> rather than yeah, kind it's, of re- kind of, it's kind of always been there. Yeah. Just, it, it's one of those things where when a, when a heavy hardcore band or somebody tries to mix it, that's what Linkin Park did, believe it or not. And Linkin Park did it really well. A lot of hardcore bands will try to mix it in, and it's like, ah, that sounded a little weird. You can try it. <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean it was bad. It was just like, okay, they, it felt like they were trying too hard. Um, it, it's all about that feel, man, especially when it comes to electronic. It has to kind of m- blend perfectly, dude. Um, <clears throat> so, I, you know what, dude? I, I'm excited. That stuff makes me very excited for the future of music. That's why, you know, how we met through the Harvard uh, re-release of The Inevitable and I, that album, dude, to this day, from the first time I heard it, I was like, wow. And, you know, it was very reminiscent. It had its moments where, you know, I'm a big Circus Survive guy, too. And I was just like, this is pretty cool. And I know they had the same producer and all that. But but there was something definitely different. Like, almost the way his approach to the vocals were, like, very Sade-ish. Which, Sonny, Sonny does the same kind of thing on a lot of our music. And I was like, wow, this is sick. And then the progressions and the the space, like the police. I, I even told the guitarist, he reached out to me. Jason uh, or Lee? Uh, Jason. And he goes, dude, thanks for, you know, the support. And, and I was like, you know what, man? I don't know if you've ever heard this, but the production and the way that you guys write in a weird way reminds me of a band that I grew up, that I loved, grew up, grew up to, Sunny Day Real Estate. Mm, yep. Just the, the sounds and the vibe. I was like, ah, I love it, right? And he was like, man, thanks, dude. That's a compliment. Well, I'm just letting you know, man, like what you guys are doing sound wise. He said there's a third record. It just hasn't been, it hasn't been recorded. It's completely written. I'm like, well, drop it, dude. I was yeah. like, come on. I want to hear it. He's all, it's amazing too. I was like, man, dude, and, you know, and you know, everyone's around all different places now. And I was like, you guys got to just get together and record that album, man. Just, just for fun. Dude. They are an interesting band. Um, a friend of mine, they literally played at a bar like mm-hmm. three minutes from my house. And a buddy of mine was like, you got to come see this band. They came through like a couple months ago. I saw them. They kind of have this like weird kind of cir- circus survive meets like glass jaw tendencies, like as far as the performance. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, like not the biggest circa fan, but I was like, you telling me that there's gonna be like a glass jaw vibe live? Like I'll go see that, especially in a small bar. And I remember just, and there's actually footage of them playing one of the songs. I forget what song it is, but there's footage from that actual show. And there was like maybe 12 of us there. And I remember just being like, man, this band's incredible. Fast forward, like I think maybe a year, um, someone had put them in touch with me to book them. And so I had them, I booked them at the intersection here in Grand Rapids. And uh, it was one of those things like hearing them, seeing them play again to a whole bunch, like to a bigger room and more people. It was just like crazy to see. And I remember they stayed with me after that show. And I had just gotten, I had just seen uh, Let Live uh, when they opened for Under Oath. Mm-hmm. Like they were the first of four or whatever with Times of Grace, which is weird <laughs> now that they're like both bands are back and actually doing really well. Um, and I just remember being so blown away by Jason's energy live. I mean, as everyone has been. And he's a teacher a, now, right? Jason is, as far as I know, yes. Jason's it's a teacher. Yeah. Does, like photography stuff too, I think. That was his other like passion. 
But I remember it was funny because like all the guys in Harbor were like, oh, you like you have this let live record. Are they good? And I was like, oh, my God, dude, they're fucking amazing. Like one of the craziest bands I've ever seen. Like I had to buy the record and the music's really good, too. And then they're like, oh, because we just got offered a tour with them. And I was just like, like, wow, that a that'll be very interesting because you guys don't sound anything alike. But I love that because that reminds me of when I used to go to shows and you'd see a you know hardcore band an indie band and like a rapper and it's like none of that works but it all works um and just to see the trajectory of harvard after basically booking them and seeing them that first time like they were a band i thought was just gonna blow up and take over like that kind of indie shoegazy post-hardcore kind of world and you know just you know i think they ended up losing their drummer first because he went and took a, a gig over in china i think um, to, to basically teach English and become a teacher great over there. Drummer, great drummer, by the God, the feel he has uh, is just phenomenal. And then, you know, to see, but that was the fun thing as a fan is getting to see Harvard change and adapt where, you know, they ended up getting this guy from uh, this band Wretched uh, out of their local scene um, that got signed. And, you know, they're like a metal metal band, like a death metal band. So to see this dude who is used to, when you usually see him is just blast beating away to see the finesse that he would have is one of those things where it's one of those where I always go death metal drummers are always interesting. Cause you think that they, they're not playing anything. Cause it just sounds like noise, like smash this, smash this, and just kind of move your hands across the kit. But when you see them play other stuff, you're like, Oh wow, you have so much feel and finesse. And that's how you're able to play what you do so quickly. Um, you just really, it's almost like sleight of hand. Like you just watch these people perform magic and watching Harvard was one of those things where it's like, you couldn't help but be captivated with that band live, like just phenomenal. And to see them, like I said, change to where Jason ended up playing bass. Uh, Jesse would play backing guitars and Lee was the main guitarist for a while toward the end of that band was just interesting to see how they were able to pull off their very ambitious sound with less people. I told him, dude, I said, dude, you guys just, I wish you would have got a big shot. Like, I go, I'm going to go big here. I go, if you guys would have just opened for like a cold play, mm -hmm. had the management like that, you guys could have done miraculous things, dude. I, I just, that band is one of those bands. I, it reminds me of the Refuse story. It's like uh -huh. when Refuse put out The Shape of Punk to Come, I went and saw when they did their first reunion. Um, mm -hmm. A couple, it's been a while now, but 2012, I, went, I think, was when it was. Yeah, I went to the observatory in Anaheim, and the singer was talking about, like, you know, it's funny because when we put this record out, no one gave two shits about us, you mm -hmm. know, and then everybody they just this, you know, this man it as a band, and, and they're like 15 years later, sold out all around the country, US tour, and I was like, to me that could be a Harvard, you know, because I know so many people that I've turned on to that, that album to, and they're all the same. Like, that's amazing, dude. Where is this band? Why are they not a band anymore? I go, dude, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, yeah, I go, it's one of those things, man. It's just like the band you, you fall in love with and then they, they just not there no more. You know? Well, I think like even, you know, cause I got to have Dennis, the, the pleasure of having Dennis on the show and talking about that experience. I have been trying to get Jace, Jason or Jesse or even Lee to come on. And I figured, you know, the, the one way I could kind of get it is Jesse to talk about, you know, foreign air and even like the stuff he was doing before foreign air, which was like bare romantic, like kind of a different offshoot of like what he was doing. And it's like that band exists in such a weird space because like, they barely did any press. Like they remind me of an old school band where it's like, you don't know anything really about any of the guys in the band other than what they're willing to let you in and see. And in that regard, it makes this band just so magical and mysterious. Like mm -hmm. we don't know anything really about them. And it's, it's one of those like where it's like, I, I could see the band getting back together in some capacity, but I also feel like they're of the mind, almost tool like where it would be like, it was a moment in time and it's past and, and yeah, you know, and we're not going to go back and revisit and, it. And dude, it's this like the refuse thing. Like I like, some of the new music that they've been putting out but it's not the same well they're not, not the same people though either yeah. so that's that's the thing i'm, I'm not saying it's any it, but it's not shaped of you know shape of punk to come so i get all that dude and, and you know what if they could ever put that third record out i would probably enjoy the hell out of it um but you know 
it, that's how me and you connected. So mm -hmm. that that was a cool um, topic to discuss because I got nothing but mad respect to that band, dude. And um, I was gonna ask you since you talk, you come from the the hardcore scene. Like, uh, were you into like um, bands like uh, Lifetime or uh, or uh, Into Another or uh, or Sensefield? So what's funny is like my. I feel like I always feel kind of bad, like when people like get into talking about like hardcore and stuff like that. Like there are definitely some of the more underground hardcore bands that I'm I'm into, but I think a lot of my hardcore and metal stuff is it's, and this sounds so bad to say it like this, but it's like uh, actually a better way to say it. So you know, some people are like, why don't you get like, why do you hate death metal? And I'm like, I just, I don't hate it. I just, I don't like the fact that it, it doesn't speak to me. And I also have a really hard time with, it seems like they hang their hat almost like, it sounds like shit on purpose. And I'm like, but it could sound better. Like you, yeah. you can tell that you are competent musicians. Why make it sound so shitty? <laughs> and to me, my thing with hardcore for a while was, was that it's like, where some people are like, oh, it's rawness is like the selling point. And I was like, yeah, but nothing like that's why I loved when Adam D and, you know, Steve Evitz and some of these producers, because I'm a big producer guy, too. I love when you find people who are able to turn that thing that you like, but like make it sound really good. So you're like, oh, this is why everyone loves this band. Like it's more akin to what the band would sound like in a live setting. And a lot of like the hardcore that I got into would be like going to see like your headliners. So it'd be like, oh, I went to go see, you know, we'll say like Unearth or Hatebreed or something like that. And then I found out about, you know, some of these other bands that went with them or getting kind of like when my friends were in the death core scene as that was becoming a thing. It's like, you know, getting introduced to bands like from a second story window, Psyopus and stuff like that, or eventually Acacia Strain. That it's like, there was something about them that tied to another thing, like the more melodic uh, metal core as it would become. I like good sounding records. I like there to be something that discerns you from everything else. A lot of my take on hardcore at the time was you were either into like the tooth and nail solid state stuff that was kind of coming out, or you were more of the kind of trust kill earache records, prosthetic, you know, some of these other labels. And like you've been saying, those bands all kind of sounded the same. If you were like, you know, there's always the joke, a Rise band sounds like a Rise band. Like Rise just caters to that demographic and they fucking hit it over the head every time. Eventually, I just kind of get bored of it and then I go, oh, what's going on over in R&B? Like you mentioned Sade. I fucking love Sade. And like Lovers Live, I've been going back and listening to that and just being like, holy shit, the playing on this record. It already was amazing, but to hear it done live, you're just like, oh, and that dude nailed that like little background part so great like to me i get more wrapped up in in other stuff like i i want to find little things like you know the roots is another great example like i have all this roots vinyl basically sitting over here and i love like one of the most underrated records in my collection and i, and I always point this to people when they go like why do you love hip-hop why do you love these things jay-z's unplugged is 100 percent why I love that. And the roots are one of my favorite bands because you listen to that record and the way that they are able to translate music, that's not typically done with instrumentation. And even on like uh big pimpin black thoughts, doing the, the bird cawing in the background. And I'm like, they had everything, every little minute detail is there. Like on some of the other songs, like, from like blueprint and stuff where there's a lot of like shuffle beats and stuff and like double hi-hat work where it's like, you know, recreating some of those 808 beats and so forth. Like the fact that they have all the instrumentation to pull all this off, it's just like, man, there's just so much layers and so much cool shit going on. That's what gets me excited. So like with hardcore, it got a little stagnant. That's why a band like refused actually broke through to me. Like fan the flames of discontent, like with a song, like rather be dead. That little gunk, 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 gunk. And then yeah. uh, there's space. There's space for that buildup to kind of keep going. They kind of perfected that on, you know, on Shape of Punk to Come with New Noise, like that buildup, the slow buildup to the big release. Like you didn't have that in hardcore the same way. Like I feel like it was hardcore became like 80s metal, kind of paint by numbers after a while. Yeah. Here's this part. Here's the open, like, gong, and then, you know, a breakdown. And it's like, I, 
can only well, hear that many times. Well, that's the, that's the same with the metalcore genre. Same, um, yeah, and, absolutely. And, and, and you know, and it's still really big, and you know, and it's it's funny, man, because that's why I love the shape of punk because when that came, I was like, wow. But see, that had very. That's why I love Faith No More. Mm, you know, great, Patton's Patton's approach at times was like, wow, that's like some HR shit that he's mm -hmm. doing. You know, could go from very beautiful to demonic sounding <laughs> and you're like just chaos but it was all controlled man and i thought it was amazing so when i heard the shape of punk the gun i was like okay this has that screechy high scream it's not like the it was a you know i'm talking about and you know i i just but see once again those bands all had their own identity dude uh you know bad brains the post-hardcore fugazi Mm -hmm. uh quicksand like you knew like each band like you just knew they, they they didn't sound like the other band i'm always going to be a huge advocate and that's for me is what makes a difference on what why a band has something and why a band doesn't speaking of a rise band that i think is absolutely phenomenal and and does has dude dance gavin dance bro the, I, way, uh... the, the way that they mess with funk and the way that they jump into some different diverse things musically in the hardcore, in the pop, mm -hmm. it's brilliant. I'm like, these kids, and it doesn't sound contrived. No. It, it's like, dude, these guys got it down. Like, I, I'm, I get, that's once another band that just kind of gave me hope. I was like, dude, this is sick. I, I can't believe, uh, I can't <laughs> believe like other bands aren't trying to like. It's hard to do though. That's the difference. You know what I mean? That's not easy. That's not an easy task, bro. That band is interesting. They have a friend. A friend of mine is in that band, and uh, we'll swap music. That'll be the fun thing about this. Um, so the guitar player Andrew uh, is in another band that's actually signed to Will, the other guitar player and singer, I believe, of Dance Gavin. Um, Will has a record label, Swan Blue Salon Records, and does Swan Fest and all this kind of other stuff. Uh, Andrew's got a band called Idola. And they are very similar in sound and approach, but I, I, I think for me, there's a lot more authenticity in what Andrew does as the main songwriter of, excuse me, of playing guitar, playing drums, playing all this kind of different stuff. He kind of is essentially a one man band. Um, so I think it helps keep the focus musically uh, tied to his vision. But I think there's a little bit more for me, there's a lot more, vulnerability and what idola does and you can kind of feel it the way the lyrics are kind of uh presented the way there's a lot of push pull in the in the music itself uh very much like a refused and some of those other kind of bands um i'll pro i'll cut this out um because i'm not allowed to release this episode um because essentially andrew i guess signed an nda to where he's not allowed to do any press um we did a show when they were touring uh, on that periphery and Don Broco, which is another great band. If you've never heard of them, you should mm -hmm. check them out. If you'd like them. Um, and we just, it literally started talking about the microphones I had to then just going on and on for like an hour. And, you know, I had asked him cause the first time we did an interview, he was like, you know, I just found out I got diagnosed with Lyme disease and, you know, he's kind of dealing with all of that. So mm -hmm. I was like, you know, how have you been? I have, I haven't seen you. I've never, this is the first time we're meeting, but we'd stayed in contact since. And I was like, you know, how have you been? And he was like, do you want the real answer? And I was like, dude, you, we talked about you getting diagnosed with Lyme. So like we talked about, you know, you growing up in Utah and the, you know, overly religious thing of Mormonism and, and all these kind of things. Like, you know, we go deep when we get together and talk. So like, fuck it, let's go. Like, you know, yeah, I want the real answer. And he's like, real answer is I, I tried to kill myself before this tour. And, you know, I'm dealing with that and I'm, you know, all these kind of other things. And we talked about how his band basically got all these opportunities and breaks because of him being in DGD and, you know, Will being, you know, the label owner and all this kind of stuff. But it also fucked him because, like, he couldn't support that record because he had to go do GGG. So it's like I put out this record, I put all this money and time and effort into and then I it basically was for nothing because I had to do this other thing to pay my bills and chase the dream and all this kind of other stuff. And yeah, it's afforded me a lot of great opportunities, but it's, it's sacrificed the thing that I'm more passionate about because that's my thing. And he sent it to the, to management and the label and they were like, this is a really great conversation and so on and so forth. But unfortunately you can't put this out. Um, it's not, that's a no go. 
Uh, and if you do, basically, you'll be in breach of your contract you signed and, you know, we'd have to take legal matters and all that kind of stuff. And it's like that was one of the first times where I learned about the gatekeepers, we'll say, in the music industry that are like, oh, we can't have people talking about the real things that happen to people in this industry and the things that people go through in order to achieve this, this success and chase their dreams. I was reading. Uh, yeah, it's funny. I was reading this book uh, as a music business book mm. and they put it in perspective. It's called the music business business for a reason. It's a business. Mm. Yep. We live in a capitalist country, capitalist society. It's all about, you're not going to ma mess with my flow of income. Mm. Yeah. I'm not going to put that out there because that's going to mess up any possibility of it could just ruin things. So yeah, man, it's like that. I've seen it myself. I wasn't in my band for a good four years and I started yeah. this band with the drummer. Mm -hmm. So I've seen both sides. I see how people get in and manipulate lawyers and labels and managers. And it's just, it, it can get, it can get ugly, man. And the thing is, now that we're older as a band and we're still here doing it, we look back on that as a learning experience and we go, you know what, man, I wish that would have never went down that way. I wish this never would have happened, but you have a lot of people. I mean, and I, and I, we're one of the last few bands that had that success. Mm -hmm. DRL top number one, you know, millions of actual tangible c CDs sold all that stuff. And if you think about it, there's a lot of people that are whispering yes, man, and trying to tell you what to do. And everyone becomes a genius. <laughs> and you're like, wait a minute. The success of why we got here is because there was four bros that started in a garage, the mm -hmm. American dream here in America, and started playing shows, started touring in a van. And we got to that. We got to the top during the double zeros, man, 2001, mm -hmm. two, three, that was us, man. We took Lincoln Park on their first tour ever as a favor to Roger Ames, the head of Warner Brothers, WIA, Warner Electra Atlantic. We were like, who are these keys? Nobody wants to get them on tour, man. I can't get them. I promise you, this was after the fundamental elements of Southtown. I promise you, you guys take my band out. I don't care if you have three bands already on the ticket, put them up front, give them 20 minutes, just get them on the damn tour. We get this this Lincoln Park, this band on there. We had no idea who they were. And we start show they start showing up early and we start seeing people showing up early to see this band. And we're like, what the hell who is it? Who are these kids? Next thing you know, dude, it just never stopped. Their record dropped and they just freaking blew up. We built a friendship with them, lifelong dude. Chester, rest in peace. And it, it just goes to show you, man, like. Well, first off, life is fragile, bro. And and it, it is, man. And and the thing is, dude, like, it, th this industry will chew you up and spit you out, bro. But as a band and as brothers, we learned, like, this is our band. Yeah. When we put a record out, it, it lives on forever, even mm -hmm. after we pass away. We can't let people come and tell us what to do. Obviously, you take the good and the bad because you know there's people out there with good intentions that really want to see you be successful but sometimes there's these guys that come in and to give you an example i'm not going to say any names here yeah that's fine but, but when we were doing it was either boom or youth nation in the studio one of the high ups came in and was like uh, i don't know about this one so i was going to ask you that question actually <laughs> well then he goes we we want it to sound more like crazy towns butterfly and, and we just looked at each other and we're like dude and then the producer howard benson turned around because i'm the vocal guy i mean i'm the big music guy in the band right so i was like it's i'm very passionate about oh, dude, that's my lick and my riff i wrote that part i was like this and he looks at me and goes i'll handle it stop you know because i was getting ready to be like no you're not gonna take my art and do that dude you know what I mean? <laughs> and um but dude you got to keep it in perspective and i, I think at a young age, when these bands are getting signed and having this quick success, dude, it's like a hurricane, dude. You're in the eye of the storm and everything is just, and you're trying to figure it all out. 
you got a family that's trying, you know, everyone's dealing with your change, your success. You got mm -hmm. friends. Then you got other bands that are hating on you. You just, it, dude, it's just a lot going on. And I feel, I feel for Andrew, man, because you know what? That all he, all he's lacking is a little bit of guidance, bro. Yeah. It, that's it. A, a heartfelt, true guidance, man. You know, because you know, life isn't always going to be cherry, bro. It's not always going to be perfect. I don't care if you're LeBron James or, you know, I don't know who's the most successful musician on the earth right now. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Dude. Success doesn't make you happy. Money doesn't make you happy. So it's like they say there's a saying, if you're a miserable poor person, mm -hmm. almost 99.9%, .9 if you get rich, you're going to be a miserable rich person. Because mm. happiness truly comes from within yourself, man. So... <laughs> Well, kind of speaking to that, and, and I'll kind of start winding this down because I don't want to take up all of your day. Um, so something that I, I think has been interesting and, and sort of loosely speaking to the music business side of things, um, you know, I, I've found it very inspiring. You know, like earlier today when I asked if we were still good for the time uh, to start and you were like, yep, just getting back from the gym and all that kind of stuff. You know, you've been posting a lot about your, your working out and you're changing your, your daily habits to be a healthier you, a more productive you. Um, you know, was, <laughs> because I've heard on other podcasts, people being like, oh, I was, you know, insert whatever person from a band being like, oh, we didn't, we, we got looked over because, you know, we weren't, we didn't have a cute guy in the band that could help sell records, could be the face of the band or this, that, or the other. Mm -hmm. Was that ever something that, anyone in the in the business side of things kind of would say to you like where they're like hey we're kind of like we would really love it if you lost some weight because you know we're it's a little bit harder to sell the look of the band because of whatever like had, was that ever a thing it, that you it, had to was, go through? It, it was but luckily for me i was the guitarist mm. if i was the singer you're gonna get crucified times 10 bro um but since i was the guitar player i still felt the heat but mm. they don't understand that when someone's carrying their issues on the outside, because a lot of that is it's from internal, man. You, your coping mechanism, a lot of people eat for comfort, emotionally eat or whatever. They're bored or they're dealing with substance abuse and that's their new addiction. Mm -hmm. And until you can up here get it figured out, which even to this day, it's a struggle for me. Um, I, I'm going, I have my demons. I'm going through a bunch of shit, but then you always got to, I was telling somebody, you can train your muscles and your heart and everything to be good, but you also got to train your mind. That's why I'm a big advocate for the PMA, dude. Mm -hmm. You know, and the thing is, it's not just a, a hipster thing to say. It's, it's some real shit, bro. Like yeah. the PMA, positive mental attitude. You have to train your mind to be that way. It's not like you wake up one day and be like, Oh, and then you're going to go through tests where it actually, it tests, it tests your, your mental strength. Oh man, this person just getting under my skin or this situation, everything's messed up. Then you got to go, how am I going to, how am I going to do better? Hmm. How do I look at the positive in the situation? And that's the hardest thing to do sometimes. Cause we want to just sit and soak in our negativity when we're down and out. And that's, that's, that's okay. Yeah. That's and the thing is, is man, um, if I can encourage anybody out there, there's two books, dude, that I will tell you guys to read just to start. The Four Agreements, amazing book that changed my life. It's a simple read, it's only like 150 pages. It comes from Mexican Toltec Indian wisdom from down south in Mexico. They were poets and artists. If you follow these four agreements, your life can change. It's not a religion, not even a self-help. It's more of a mentality. Like I need to try to do this better. Like what the first agreement, don't take anything personal. You know how hard that is? <laughs> Extremely. Like when, when you're an emotional being, emotional artist, musician, mm -hmm. we, 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 hope we put our hearts on our sleeves. That's the hardest thing to do. I struggle with that one. But now that you read it and you kind of apply it to your life, it gives you perspective, okay? That's their dream. That's their journey. And they're taking it and deflecting on to me. Hmm. 
their their negativity. And maybe we're not meant to be in each other's lives. I got to brush it off, not take it personal, move on. Those are the types of things that you learn. Mm. Another by another another book is my boy, John Joseph, mm. from Chrome mm. Chrome Mags. Yep. We've become friends online, and uh, it was through a book because Terry from Ant Farm recommended it because he knew I was into the Four Agreements. Was the PMA effect? Mm-hmm. I read that book, and I was like, dude, this is on the same type of level as the Four Agreements. Those two books are starters. I would say read those two books. But really read them. Don't be watching TV and get distracted. Go to a beautiful place, a positive place where you can sit down, take it all in and read a couple chapters. Take it in, man. It, it, it makes a difference. I think that's something in, in this pandemic that I've uh, you know, had some things that I've talked about on the podcast previously. So I'm not going to re-share the story again and again. But essentially <laughs> had something that happened Um that made me go like, man, like I need to go get like help. Cause mentally, like I'm just not in a good spot and went to therapy. And, you know, for a while, like, you know, I think that, you know, we, we constantly as a culture talk about like, we need to destigmatize uh, mental health, mental wellness and all this kind of stuff and, and be advocates for people being willing to reach out and and get help that they need. And it was one of those things where in light of the pandemic where we're all locked down, we can't go see people and all this kind of stuff. Thankfully, I had this to at least have some interaction and and being able to have new experiences where everyone else is stuck in their own. But the other thing was, you know, gone were the excuses, basically, where it's like I can literally have therapy doing a setup almost identical to this, where it's like I'm on a webcam, I can see the person I'm talking to, we have our session, and you know, the first session felt like word vomit where I was just like, oh, and and then, you know, I'm like, oh, I don't know how you're going to get anything out of that. (laughs) And then, you know, my therapist was like, oh, well, um, have you thought about this or have you noticed these things? And, you know, each session, there was always just this, this little piece that basically it was like, think about this. And was one of those things like, you know, the, the joke I keep making is it's like, you know, it was like seeing in 2D my whole life. And then through the pieces of information I was given, it's like, holy shit, a 3D world exists. Does anyone else know about this? Can anyone else see these things? Like how it has opened my eyes to things. And it's funny. It's almost serendipitous, basically, that you mentioned the whole brushing things off, not taking things personally. So like today I made a comment on something in a Facebook group. Someone got back to the person that essentially I was talking to. I haven't talked to this person in probably a good six, seven years after some other shit that where I was just finally like, you know what? It's fine. I I guess we're just not meant to be in each other's lives anymore. Like it is whatever. Haven't thought about them since. And then they were like, oh, it's I guess you're still talking shit. It's great to see things haven't changed. And I was like, all right. And I started to go like down this whole thing. And part of my therapy was I have a tendency to overthink things. I'll start solving problems that aren't even there yet. And instead of just being in the moment and kind of going, okay, like let's focus on the information I do have. How can we solve these problems now? And I started to fall into the old habit of just like, okay, well, I'm going to do this and then they're going to say this and then I'm going to have this witty rebuttal. And then I thought about it some more and then I was just like, why? Why even do that? What is the fucking point? At the end of the day, here's what's going to happen. We're still not going to agree. We're still not going to see eye to eye on this thing. And all we're going to do is argue on the internet, which isn't going to solve anything anyway. Mm -hmm. So you know what? I'm just, I'm done. And I like had everything that I was going to do and all these things. And I was like, I'm done. And And, and I applaud you for that because dude, it's not about being right. It's about doing what's right. A lot of people want to be right. And it's like, that's a big problem in our society today with politics bro i'm like you guys know if you want to believe in the american society and american people as a whole it's got to bend it's got to go back and forth we got to meet in the middle everyone Mm -hmm. has forgotten about that middle ground everyone wants to be right the right wants to be right the left wants to be right it's like look guys let's meet in the middle and let's 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 compromise and try to make it best for the next generation to come dude you guys are just making it worse so yeah. you did the you did the good thing, man. And I, I just want to say, dude, like the biggest misconception, and I, I probably got to jump too, bro, but yeah. is this, man. 
and this maybe it's a testosterone machismo thing, but you know, I don't know how many friends I've, I've, cause I, I've, I, I had a cognitive therapist way back for about three or four years and cognitive therapy has to do with emotions and, and, you know, some really deep stuff. And I did that and I was going through some stuff. This was years ago. And now I have a life coach, which the mm -hmm. difference is a therapist goes down that dark, deep childhood, you know, all that stuff where a life coach is there to kind of, Hey, give you that pep, help you see things differently, but coach you, Hey, what's best for you. And yeah. there's two different things. The misconception is that you're weak mm. because you need that. And I've spoken to many friends who are like, Oh dude, that's weak. I'm like, actually, that's not weak. You know, pride is weak. Humility is strength. Mm. And I know that for a fact, and I just want to tell you and your viewers and listeners, if you have an issue, whether it's weight, drugs, and you really are fed up, there are people out there that are willing to help you. You just have to go look, look for it. It's like looking for a record, dude. Mm -hmm. I really want this album. I'm going to go look for it. If you want it, you'll get it. Yeah. You, there's help out there. It's not weak. And I want to tell everybody, if you need help, just ask because there's people out there willing to help you. Yeah. I think that's a great place to end. I I'm, I'm, didn't know I was going to take up an hour and a half of your day, but I'm very thankful for the time and, and the, the quickness to, to get this uh, Hold on. Done. I got I to do one, one last thing. Since, okay. Since, well, I'm going to consider you a homie now. You know. Okay. <laughs> uh. <laughs> you know, it's all respect, my brother. For sure. For sure. Absolutely. I... Uh, I guess we'll, we'll uh, is there anything you would like to plug uh, anything online? I know obviously you guys have the, uh, the satellite uh, tour that I mean, tours are getting announced. Thank God. Um, so I know you guys have that, but is there anything else you would like to plug uh, where people well, can find you? Yeah. I mean, it's the 20th anniversary for satellite and uh, we're going to play that record kind of like Pink Floyd style from beginning to end. And we're going to be coming to a city near you. I mean, mainly places where restrictions aren't so harsh. Um, we got a two month tour booked and um, we're taking from ashes to new out um, all good things and sleep sirens, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to um, be playing that record for a little bit. And at the same time, we're also writing new material for a new record. Um, and then check out my, my other project foreign lands. If you get a chance, um, I haven't released anything yet, but you can go to our Instagram and, you know, kind of vibe out the instrumental music and stuff. But other than that, we'll see you out on the road. Yeah, looking forward to it. Hopefully uh, you'll get to Michigan or close-ish so I can try to come catch a show. And I mean, it's that. Detroit or Flynn. We haven't been up to Grand Rapids in quite some time, man. I know. You guys need to rectify that. But actually, the uh, I think you guys are playing Pierre's, which is equal distance to me to Detroit. And I actually like that venue a little bit better. Okay, Personally. I think when in oh, Detroit we're playing uh, St. Andrews. Yep, yeah. yeah. I haven't been there in a long time either. So well, if, be... if you come on out, let me know, bro. We'll yeah, for sure. Coffee. We'll grab a coffee or a bite or whatever, man. Sounds good. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right, late. So that was my conversation with Marcos from POD. Want to thank him for taking the time on a random, uh, I think we talked on a random Tuesday or Monday, actually. I can't remember exactly which, but... It was really cool getting to uh, get to talk to him. And, and after such, uh, we have uh, exchanged music uh, that we both are into and that some of which we talked about on the show. Um, and that's something else, too. If you ever hear myself or uh, the guest recommend something, feel free to, if you don't already, to go check out that music. So Marcos and I had DM'd each other. And so I had sent him uh, Idola's Degenitera album. And I haven't heard back yet whether he's listened to it or not, but with him being a Dance Gavin Dance fan and Andrew being in Dance Gavin Dance uh, as well as Idola, I'm sure he'll probably really enjoy uh, Idola's music. Uh, and if you haven't heard the chat I did with Andrew, go back, listen to that. That was a really good one as well. And uh, the music's really great. I always champion an Idola. Um, I think if you are a fan of kind of progressive -y rock metal, I don't really know what to even call it. It's just good music. But as such, uh, Marco sent me Lane 8 uh, and sent me a playlist that he has over on Spotify of just different Lane 8 stuff. And it was really cool. Like immediately, like when I, I turned it on, you know, it was, it was kind of chill, really ambient. And, uh, 
you know, as I'm kind of starting to get more into that style of music, uh, more of the EDM kind of synth wave kind of stuff, it just gets kind of interesting to see how it informs other music you listen to where you're like, oh, like when you find out someone's into this kind of music, you're like, oh, I totally can hear like this influence kind of coming through. Um, and I think that's what all the great artists do is we're able to pull from influence which is like and, and sprinkle them into what we're doing so you may not know it's a direct influence but you can you can hear it once you know that it's there um it's almost like cooking uh, once you know what the ingredients are that you're using you can start tasting them uh, and speaking of tasting um i want to talk about a beer i had yesterday uh watching the atlanta hawks uh lose uh sadly to the Milwaukee Bucks in basically the last couple of minutes, uh, Trey Young injured his ankle, which I have an in ankle injury as well, and I know it's been a, a bit of a struggle uh, constantly having to ice it and stay off of it, uh, so I can't imagine trying to play a playoff basketball game on it. Um, but all that said, uh, my friend uh, from out in Oregon went out to this place. Uh, I believe she said it was in Montana. It's Sasquatch Brewing Company, and she got me this Mortal Kombat. Uh, I think I posted the can already on socials. It is really cool. It is a Mortal Kombat label, uh, basically, with a, I believe, a graham cracker and a marshmallow fighting each other. Uh, and then the Mortal Kombat is in like the old Mortal Kombat font basically uh the can alone is worth the purchase i don't know how much he paid for it doesn't really matter but the can alone is worth the purchase because it is a, f a great can everyone i've shown it to has been like yo that's a really dope can um the beer itself uh was pretty good i was it's always funny when you have something that's supposed to have marshmallow there's only probably been maybe one or two beers i've really had where i'm like bam there's the marshmallow um this was more of a graham cracker heavy flavor uh, with a little bit of like a, a sweet chocolate at the end, kind of because of the stout flavor, um, really complimented that. I didn't really get any marshmallow, and I, and I know that that maybe could have been some of the sweetness too to, to add to the chocolate, but it really was more of a, a sweetness from the chocolate flavor to me. Um, I would say it's a good chocolate graham cracker stout. Um, nothing to, to still be upset about. It was a, a solid beer, uh, especially if you're into stouts. Um, I would definitely be interested in trying something else from this brewery. I know, I think I actually have some more from this brewery that she got. So you'll hear more about that down the road. And, uh, to wrap up this episode, cause it was a little bit of a longer chat. Um, want to go ahead and say, if you want to follow POD, it is straight up POD everywhere, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, super simple. Uh, and if you would like to follow Marcus, he is at official Marcus Curell, Curell, again, I'm not entirely sure how to say his last name, uh, all one thing on Instagram and Twitter is just Marcos Curell. Um, they're all in the show notes. And on top of that, if you go to either of those two Twitter, Instagram pages of Marcos's, he has tagged the band there. So it's a one stop basically for any social media you're on, uh, to follow the band. They are getting ready to do the 20th anniversary, uh, tour of satellite where they'll be playing the album in full tickets are on sale now. And the remastered version of the record is coming out on nine 11. So lots to look forward to, uh, within the camp of POD, uh, touring is coming back and I'm really hoping to go see, uh, see a date of this tour um i've not seen pod in, in quite a long time and uh last time i did was a lot of fun um you know i don't know how you could not have fun at a pod show uh, it's damn near impossible and for the brutally speaking podcast if you would like to keep up with us simple enough brucespeakpod.com is our landing page for everything click any link you need to go wherever you need to go and it'll also have a link to our show sponsors run those down real fast on point pomade use our code bsp15 and you'll get 15% off your total purchase order. We're actually going to be talking to Maddie Mullins. Uh, I'm going to be talking to him on Tuesday. So you'll probably hear that in probably about three to four weeks. Uh, so there'll be that. I uh, can't wait to chat with him and chop it up again. Always a great dude. Uh, head on over to rockabilia.com. Uh, use our code BREW. Take 10% off your total purchase order. And last but not least is The Bean Bastard. Head on over to thebeanbastard.com. Pick up some delicious coffee. And if you're in the Buffalo, New York area, go to their brick and mortar store. Support those guys and gals. And for the Brutally Speaking Podcast, I'm... I am John, and next week, it's not going to be episode 300 in the traditional sense. We are actually doing our collab episode with the Vox and Hops uh, podcast with Matt of Cryptopsy. Uh, I was on his podcast, and basically what he likes to do is basically... We, he calls them collabs, and we talk about beer. We talk about how you know how I got into metal, how I got into beer and liquor and all that kind of stuff. We talk about all kinds of things. It's a nice, decent, long chat, and... Uh, You'll hear it uh, next week. So I'm going to drop that uh, next Friday. So it won't come out at a normal time, 
but then we will uh, do our episode 300 after that. So looking forward to dropping that. And if you haven't already, go follow Vox and Hops. Uh, go check out what Matt's doing. He just did a, an awesome collaborative, very inspiring collaborative series between 24 different breweries here in North America as he is in Canada. I uh, actually went to one of the breweries here in Grand Rapids was one of the uh, participants of that, which was a collaboration between them and the band Battlecross, which are also from here in Michigan. And I uh, got to hang out with Haran and with Don. Um, so really cool getting to hang out with those guys. And uh, there's there's some things kind of percolating there as well. Um, so really excited to uh, to get this episode out with Matt and the Vox and Hops. Brutally speaking, it's been a long time coming. So uh, look forward to that next week and we'll talk to you then. Oh, that fucking sucked. Shao Kahn, what'd you think? That was pathetic. Yeah. Yeah. Coach, what'd you think? Okay. Okay. I mean, I knew it was gonna fucking suck, but... I think those guys were a little rude. Austin Powers? How about new? Okay, I thought we were going to get the Austin Powers vote. We did not. John, use that for your podcast. It fucking sucks. But uh, you knew what you were getting into. Uh, it will result in less listens. You're going to see a <coughs> decline in listeners if you start the show with that. You're going to see 30 seconds in, the number will plummet. And I will be there at the bottom of the plummet saying, I fucking told you. Don't use this fucking riff. It sucks. <laughs> 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 <laughs>